first speaker in this technical block, general CFD, is Giacomo Rismondo from University of Trieste. Giacomo, the floor is yours. Thank you for the presentation. Good morning at all. So the presentation is uh, structured like this, a briefly introduction and uh, the methodology, the numerical setup and some results and the conclusions and the future development. So the topics that we study are fundamental too. The first is a phenomenon when the interaction between a linear elastic body and an incompressible free flow play an important role. And our first classical example is uh, the vibration of a flex due to the, the wind load, or for example, the vibration of guitar chord that produces noise, music, or the collapse of the Tacoma Bridge. This is a famous failure in the structural engineering when the principal frequency of the Detachment vortices in the fluid flow is synchronized to the fundamental frequency of the structure, and uh, it is called the resonant phenomenon and the collapse of the structure. The second topic is the generation, the propagation of the noise that is generated by this uh, immersed uh, solid. And in particular, we are interested to study the influence of the interaction between the fluid and the structure on the acoustic field. A classical example is uh, the marine propeller. Probably the marine, if we consider the stiffness of the marine propeller, this uh, doesn't influence uh, consistently the fluid dynamic field and the acoustic field because it fundamentally is a rigid structure. But uh, on the other hand, the wind turbine is a wind turbine blade is a slender body and uh, it vibrates and probably influence uh, consistently the fluid dynamic field and the acoustic field. The motivation are because the marine renewable energy devices has been increasingly adopted in the last years and they produce some positive uh, aspects like the clean energy production. But on the other hand, they produce loud noise and uh, vibration that uh, propagate into the environment. And uh, this is translated in uh, acoustic pollution. In fact, the marine fauna is attracted by the artificial reefs, but uh, the noise that uh, is, uh, this device is uh, produced decreases drastically the range of uh, communication of the, of the fish. So the objectives are uh, the study of this kind of phenomenon using the numerical method. In particular, the hydraulic research group from the University of Trieste is my research group, contribute a lot in the field. In this slide, I'd like to present the study that my group done. He studied the free dynamic field on the propeller. You can see the vorticity around the propeller. And on the left side, you can see the acoustic generation and propagation in, uh, in, into the domain. On the top panel is the mean value of the acoustic pressure. In the video is the instantaneous pressure due to the marine propeller. Now we want to make a step forward considering the fluid structure interaction. And we start from a simple case of study a cylinder square cylinder immersed in a turbulent flow. The future development, development are uh, applied with numerical methodology to study <coughs> more interest uh, complex phenomena like the acoustic generated by the wind turbine. Uh, in order to seek uh, the best material, the best shape to the acoustic pollution reduction. So the methodology, uh, I just mentioned above that uh, we use the numerical method. We use uh, open form extend uh, 4.1 because uh, the fluid structure interaction algorithm is already implemented. It is a partitioned algorithm 
So it, uh, there are two different solvers, one for the fluid and one for the solid, respectively. And the exchange of information between the two solver is in a, in an iterative way, it's an implicit scheme. And um, we use for the free dynamic field, the large ID simulation, because uh, we are interested in all spectrum of the turbulence, because uh, I will speak about the acoustic, but the, in a minute, but the, the whole turbulence has this generate noise. And this is so important. So you can use the runs approach. So the algorithm works uh, in this way. Here's all the, the free dynamic field. And uh, so we consider the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation over a dynamic mesh. So the mesh motion is taken into account. And um, by uh, the mesh distortion is, uh, is due to the Laplace equation, diffusion Laplace equation. The load on the body pass through the solid solver to the set from the fluid solver to the solid solver, and uh, the momentum equation is solved using the second order piola kirchhoff stress tensor. And uh, the displacement of the body is individuated. After uh, the solid displacement uh, was transferred by the solid solver to the fluid solver, and so on. The second part of the methodology is the evaluation of the acoustic field. So I would like to remember that the, the noise is related to the perturbation of pressure and density. So the, the variation of density must be taken into account. But I just above mentioned that we use the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation because we use the acoustic analogy. Does, know, does anybody know the acoustic analogy? Yeah, okay. So the acoustic analogy was developed by Lightil. It consists uh, briefly in recast the compressible and stokes equation to found a wave equation with a source term. And the source term is function only of the incompressible free dynamic field. So we can use the incompressible and stokes equation to solve the free dynamic field. And after we can use the uh, wave equation to solve the free dynamic, the, the acoustic field. In particular, we use the fox william hawking equation, is the integral solution of the wave equation. In this equation, there are the first term, is the thickness term. This is the sound due to the vibration of the body. In fact, where it depends by the velocity of displacement of the body. The second term is a time derivative of the pressure on the body. And it is called first loading term. The third term also depends by the pressure on the body. These three surface integrals are the linear part of fox william hawking equation. And the last three integral are the nonlinear part of fox william hawking equation. And this is the sound related to the turbulent wave. The vortices generate sound. And this is the contribution of the vortices and the turbulent wave. This is the reason because we need to use the large eddy simulation. Oh, sorry. Sorry. And we resolved this uh, equation using a homemade utility built by Professor Marta Atzenfara. It's a simple utility like a function object in open form. So we start from a simple case of study as the under square cylinder immersed in a turbulent flow. We study two different configurations for the solid stiffness, one rigid and one elastic. And um, a famous phenomenon occurs in this, uh, this, uh, this case of study is the typical phenomenon of a black body immersed in a turbulent flow. It is called the von Karman vortex shedding. I think that uh, anybody knows the word Karman vortex shedding. And this is the periodic detachment of the vortices behind the structure. And this induces a periodic alternate on the lift force. So the vibration of the body is induced by this uh, alternate uh, periodic uh, of, the, of the pressure on the body. 
Oh, so some uh, geometrical and boundary condition aspect. We use the, a diameter of the cylinder of 0 0.4 meter. The edge is uh, 30 diameter in order to have a cylinder body. It is immersed in hydrodynamic turbulent flow characterized by a Reynolds number 4,000. This is the minimum volume to have a, a completely turbulent wake because we try to minimize the computational cost. This is the a first uh, experimental analysis, numerical analysis. And in the table, there are the boundary condition. The fundamental one is the moving wall velocity on the cylinder, because in the elastic case, the velocity on the cylinder is not zero, but is equal to the velocity of the displacement. <coughs> For the solid properties, I just mentioned that uh, the uh, von Karman phenom phenomenon induced the vibration on the body. So we choose the body properties in order to have that the fundamental frequencies of detachment vortices is equal to the first fundamental frequencies of the solid body. We use the analytical equation, but uh, in addition, we made a computational uh, numerical analysis using MATLAB PDA toolbox, because for this simple uh, solid, the analytical equation was found, but in an arbitrary geometry, this is not uh, the, the, the analytical equation uh, very reason. And so in this way, we choose the stiffness and the density of the body. So some uh, results. We study for first the hydrodynamic coefficient in the rigid configuration. We record the time. Uh, we, in this slide, uh, you can see the time record of the drag and lift coefficient. And we compare the mean drag coefficient with the previous uh, reference uh, data that uh, was the work done by Professor Marta Cianfera that compared the mean drag coefficient with the 2D dimensional case, just to have an order of idea. And we found the Strobel number, so the mean frequency of the Borg-Karman shed, vortex shedding. After we studied the elastic case and in a similar way, and we see that the mean drag coefficient is, a, is less compared to the rigid one. And um, the fundamental frequency of detachment vortices is uh, quite similar. After we analyzed the mean velocity profile in uh, the in direction of motion. This is the average velocity in some section near the length of the cylinder. And we see that the vibration of the body does not influence uh, so much the mean free flow. But uh, if you look at the turbulent intensities, you can see from the dashed line, you see the elastic case, the solid line is the rigid one but the turbulent intensities is more greater in the elastic case compared to the rigid one. This means that the vibration of the body induces a greater amount of turbulence intensity into the flow. This is an important characteristic so, that we found. After we analyze the displacements of the body, in the top panel, there is the displacement in the direction of motion. We see that uh, Periodically, behavior in the start of the simulation was found, and after, uh, as the time increases, a quasi-static condition was found. And this value is comparable to the value of the displacement, considering a simple um, cantilever beam subjected to the uniform load uh, equal to the mean pressure in the direction of motion. In the opposite direction, we see we found two different behavior. The first behavior is like a system subjected to a, a periodic force with a slightly frequency respect to the sorry okay thanks. Uh, a slightly frequency compared to the frequency fundamental frequency of the solid and, and as the time increasing there is a synchronization between these two fundamental frequencies. 
Here is a simple video of the displacement of the body in the direction perpendicular to the motion. After we studied the acoustic field, we, we, we studied the directivity of the acoustic pressure. So this is the root mean square of the pressure in the coordinate, cylindrical coordinate. This is the near field at one diameter. And you can see that the intensity in the elastic case is more higher to respect to the rigid one. And this is due to the thickness term. And this is the only linear part of the Fox William Hawking equation. As the distance increases, this difference becomes negligible. And uh, if we look at the nonlinear part, we see that the preferential direction of propagation of the acoustic pressure is quite different. This means that the uh, turbulent wake is quite different from the rigid case to the elastic one. In fact, if uh, this is the sum of the linear and the nonlinear part, we see that the intensities in the near field is more higher in the elastic case. And as the distance increases, the, this difference becomes negligible. In fact, uh, here is a video. Uh, we see that the vibration of the of the body induce uh, a greater generation of uh, small turbulent eddies and decrease the generation of a more greater and current structure. And uh, you can see from this video. In conclusion, we see that the. Mm, the mean drag coefficient is less in the elastic case. The turbulent intensity is more higher in the elastic case compared to the rigid one. And um, this is uh, visible in the turbulent wake, like I just above mentioned. The future develop are the, after the assessment of the numerical uh, methodology, the study of the wind turbine is still my work. I still work on them. We perform some CFD simulation about the wind turbine using large eddy simulation. After we made the structural analysis of the wind turbine blade, and uh, finally we study the acoustic field using the acoustic analogy. Thank you. Some references. Questions from the audience? Wait, wait, Morgan. No, we don't. Uh, some uh, turbulent model. We use only the wave model. Oh, the time step size, I think uh, one uh, to the power of minus four. I, I, it's only I remember. Uh, yeah, because the mean frequencies is 3.3 3 hertz and it's quite, it's a quite large period for the. Like, more questions? No. Let's thank her. Ah, sorry. Yeah, for sure, because uh, the acoustic is related to the perturbation of pressure but uh, due to the compressibility of the fluid flow. So you could find the acoustic field resolving the compressible Navier-Stokes equation, including the energy equation and the thermodynamic states of the, of the fluid flow. Acoustic energy is only a, a simplified to, to study the problem. Simplification. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We need to continue with our next speaker.
we have Henrik Rusche from Wiki Germany. Well, thank you, Tessa, for the introduction. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Henrik Rusche, and I will present work done at Wiki in collaboration with Volkswagen. Um, so myself, Sergei Lesnik, and uh, Alexander Kabat fell job uh, of Volkswagen. How do I step forward? Okay. Found it. Okay. So my talk is um, labeled reduced order models for boundary layers and thin structures. And we have an application. Um, it's a glass window. So don't be surprised if everything changes in a, in a while, but it is a nice prototypical application um, for, for what I will present in terms of uh, the mathemat uh, mathematics and the numerics. So as an introduction, I've uh, drawn a few pictures of boundary layers. Um, so the top one is what you typically know, the turbulent boundary layer of a plate. And the other one down there, the second one is a bit more complicated and it depicts um, a double diffusion layer, reacting diffusion layer or electric do double layer in a, what you will find in a battery, for example. So um, the ions, are getting towards the interface and they form very, very thin, um, oh, call it boundary layer interfaces. Um, something that where you don't want to put necessarily a lot of mesh uh, because you want to look at the full battery rather than just the, um, the electrode or the membrane or something like that. Okay, so this kind of stuff we find frequently. Yeah, you are all aware of the turbulent boundary layers. Um, they also come in thermal boundary layers. Um, if you are a chemical engineer, you have seen them reacting because there is something catalysts on the wall. Um, normally the, the walls are not flat and polished, but they will be a porous media in with where the catalyst is reacting within the porous media. Um, I, I talked to you about the electric double layers. Um, there's a lot of that in electrochemistry. And, um, but there's also nice ones um, like rapidly heated walls where the wall is evaporating or melting, um, stuff like that. So all of these problems, you could do that simply by putting more mesh. So you just mesh it and you end up with, uh, I don't know, 10 cells in a micrometer, but you don't want to do that. Yeah, that's why um, people invented turbulent boundary layers in the first place. So we need to bridge those subgrid problematic um, layers. And we can do that. Um, and these subgrid models, I would call them, they are typically an algebraic expression. And you get to the algebraic expression by assuming steady state. So you say, my flow near the wall is steady state during this time step. It's quasi-steady. And by doing that, you've lost the dynamics um, because the, the states that might be important and that you might want to um, take care of, or where there might be a time derivative, you just said it doesn't exist. So you have no way of doing um, um, to accumulate some properties. Okay. Um, well, there is a little method and it's called the finite, element, uh, finite uh, area method that used to be in form extent, but it also has been ported to the ESI version. And that allows you to solve transport equations along the surfaces. And we successfully applied that to couple, a couple of problems, and most notably is uh, thin films and uh, lubrication in, in Zagreb. So um, that's all there. Um, but with the finite area, as a finite area, just if you don't know, it allows you to do finite volume, but pushed flat along a surface. And it can be curved. 
So that's all, all nice. And it, that came from uh, Delko Tukovic a long time ago. It was his thesis, so it's uh, ancient. Um, we can couple it. We can couple finite area and finite volume. We can exchange, we have all the mapping. So that's wonderful. What's wrong with that? And it, it also has a time derivative and a convection term. So everything is there. My problem with that is because I have one state for the temperature, for example, or one state for something, um, I don't have a spatial, um, I need to, need to assume something um, to, to, to put some spatial variation in particularly to in, in particular perpendicular to the wall. And I always wondered, well, okay, well, how can I do this systematically? Right? Because people said, oh, well, the, the, the velocity is, of course, it's a parabolic profile. Yeah. Uh, and then you say, okay, well, this maps because I only get one degree of freedom. Yeah. Because I cannot afford more because that one I can put into my finite area. And I said, well, why? And what, what we do here is it gives you more freedom uh, in, that, in that respect. So how can we do this systematically? And why? Why did I do that? That was the project with Volkswagen. And the project with Volkswagen is a heated rear window. And there is a picture here. So you see the rear window and the hole is for the, for the wiper. And the green wires um, are the electric heating. You all know that, yeah, from your car. Should, should have one in the back. Um, OK. And the design of those uh, wires is important because they are made of uh, silver. Uh, so you don't want to use more wire than absolutely necessary. Well, obviously, you don't want to block the view of the driver, but um, <laughs> far away from that, you want to make them as thin as possible. And of importance is are the actually not the wires because they are just long and have a, have a certain thickness but um, the distribution areas on the left and the right, because that makes sure that the right current, the same current is going through each of the wires. So um, if we look at this, it's a multi-scale problem. Uh, so the, 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 um, the window is something two meters wide. And um, if I go backwards, then um, the spacing between the wires is something like 60 millimeters. Uh, okay, well, that's not too bad. Um, the wires themselves, um, they are 0.3 millimeters wide and 1.1 millimeter high. Okay, so now you have a problem. Again, you can, you can mesh it. It's not a problem, yeah? You just put a lot of mesh and we have polyhedral. So you end up with, I don't know, 20, 20, 25 million for the whole thing. Um, and you have to simulate it for 20 minutes because that is the heating heat up time that you want to consider. So it's not terrible, but it's not nice because after all, the amount of physics we are solving is limited as you will see on the second slide. Um, but it's crying for um, reduce order or reducing the dimensionality of the problem, right? So. Yeah. Um, so I had to convince Volkswagen that, that, that this is a good idea um, because, in fact, the temperature variation in the glass is important, where the temperature variation in the wire is not because it's, it's silver. Yeah, there's not a problem. It's always going to be fairly uniform, but the glass is not. And technically, what is happening in steady state is that you have the wire. The wire puts in energy per length, and it's radiated out over the 30 millimeters. So the gradients at the top and bottom glass wall or interface, they are important yeah, because they determine how much um, energy is lost. Okay, oh, so what do we do physics-wise? Um, physics-wise, we have two Laplacians. Um, it couldn't get much, e much easier. So the first one is for the um, electric wire. And um, yeah, so the sigma is the electric conductivity and V is the voltage. So, uh, or electric potential. And the second one um, is, is for the, is the energy balance. And um, what is missing here are the boundary conditions. So you will have some sort of mixed boundary condition uh, on, the, on the top 
and the bottom of the glass. So if this is my glass, yeah. so going to infinity, alpha times something where you guess guess the heat transfer coefficient. Um, okay, so that's that's what we have. Couldn't be easier. So, um, now, how do we get equations that we can put into our thumb? Yes, we can. We can use it with thumb, and then we say, okay, there is a temperature for the for the glass, but we have only one temperature, and that doesn't quite feel right. And you will also see evidence of why it's probably not a good good uh, thing in the first place. Um, so I've been digging through books, and I ended up with the method of weighted residuals, and it, basically it's the it's the um, um, if you look at finite elements, method of resi uh, weighted residual comes on top. So you do method of weighted residuals, and then you go into different finite element methods. So method of finite uh, residuals, it takes the um, your transport equation. So Laplacian of T in our our spend. I did I ripped out the time derivative. It's not uh, not a major complication, and we look at it in two dimensions here. So what we put in is trial functions. Yeah, that's the t is t zero times the sum of some functions. In the sum functions, we have some constant c. Um, we stick that all in. We say that the um, we introduce some weighting functions w, and then we minimize uh, the weighting functions to give us the best approximation for our trial trial functions. So the the job of m uh, of the weight of the method of weighted residuals is to choose constants of C um, so that the residual is, so, is, is going to zero in some sense. Uh, and there is variations of the game, which is not, it's not the most important thing. You just end up with different equations, but it's, this is not what I want to talk about. Um, so one, one choice is a Galakian method in which you choose the weighting functions um, to be your trial functions. And then you do the maths, you do the integrals, you get, what you get in the end is a, is a linearization. Yeah, so you do the same thing like with finite elements, uh, with finite volumes, but you get a coupled system. So you get one equation or you get a set of um, uh, linear equations for the C1s, for the C2s, but at different points in the mesh. So now, why, why do I say that? Um, I say that because I can do the whole thing, I can do the trial functions in one direction instead of two. Okay, and what, if I do the same thing and I go through the maths, what I end up with is, is a um, transport equation for the weights C, but it is flattened by one, one dimension. So I can go from 2D into 1D, or I can go from 3D, like my boundary layer, into 2D. And I can still have the same machinery. I can still choose my weight functions. And it depends on what kind of weight functions and it, what, how you bring in boundary conditions. So there's a lot of variation here and, and trickery. Um, but this is what, what is happening. And this is nice because I can do that with any transport equation or coupled system of transport equations. Um, and it will give me transport equations along my surface, which is what I wanted. Okay, um, so here's my, my glass again. Um, so what we do, because we didn't trust the numerical method at all. Um, and uh, so what we do is we have a 2D model meshing um, the wire and the glass, but just for 30 centimeters, the distance. And that gives me symmetric boundary conditions, cyclic. That's all, all fine and nice. And this is my benchmark. And what you see in, in comparison, what you will see is a 1D uh, simulation. So here's the reference solution for you um, at different distances from the wire. So the first top line in black is the distribution of temperature just under the wire. And as you could expect, is the wires on the right-hand side. As you come from the right to the left and you go through the glass, the temperature decreases because it's hottest under the wire. 
And that disturbance, if you want, that, that decays as you go to 30, to, to 30 millimeters. Okay, so um, now we also try different degrees because you can use your polynomial. Um, there is one reference line and what we found here is that second order is, is quite, quite good and sufficient. We also did some um, in lateral, um, some, some variations in lateral um, um, coordinates. And what you see here, if you use five cells for the 30 millimeters, that gives you seven degrees Kelvin in, in difference, which is too much, but you can bring it down. Yeah, so I think we settled something for the red one. So 20, 30 cells between the wires is just sufficient. Um, okay, and here is the, the glass in full glory. Um, the bottom is, a, um, is an experiment. So infrared um, image with some reference temperatures. Um, so there is some hot spots, and uh, the top one is our simulation. And there, there are some variations um, which we will resolve in an ongoing going project, uh, especially there in the distributors on the sides. But in general, um, the whole thing works works quite well. So you get the hot spot near the near the wiper hole. That's quite well um, predicted, and and some of the hotspots here to the right and left is is not so not so well. So, but that, that's all coming coming together. We know what that is, um, but it's not it's not in the numerics. So, so that's actually pieces of physics missing in the model. Okay, so conclusions. Um, we successfully used. Um, method of multi-weighted residuals to derive transport equations in, two, in 2D from 3D. And um, that reduces the cost uh, of the simulation. So what that was faster factor of two or something like that for, for the reference um, that we had. So similar fidelities. Um, for the method of weighted residuals, uh, this can be applied to anything. Yeah, so you can think about doing redoing um, turbulent wall layers. It's not something that I would try um, as a first thing because I need to learn more about the method. But um, I, I think this would also be, be good for predicting separation and, and things like that because you get, get more states into your model that could be helpful. But turbulent boundary layers, uh, there's just too many people and bright people that have done a lot of work on that. So that wouldn't be my first thing. But um, batteries, I think, is a, is a very good one because th there you are totally in the dark uh, concerning the uh, electric double layers. OK, so that's where we want to go with the method. And so we are looking for more, um, more work. And um, as the, all the coupling is, is there, yeah? So we have, have everything in terms of machining. So thank you very much. Thanks, Henrik. Any questions from the audience? Just repeat the question. Yes, um, so Miguel was asking what are the what are the boundary conditions in the in the physical problem and how are they handled in the equivalent um, reduced order model? Okay, so yes, you, what what you would typically so we are not solving for the conjugate problem, so we're not solving for the um, passenger compartment and the outside. So what we do there is we assume some alpha 
um, some heat transfer coefficient and uh, it could be better, but at the moment it's a constant. So what you get is a mixed boundary Robin run, uh, boundary condition. Okay, so that's what's what's happening in the physics and what you would do with you when you do the full mesh. If you reduce it, what will happen is this will become a source term. And because it's a mixed boundary condition, it will be an, it will have an implicit part and a source term. Yeah, we, we have a continuation on the project. Um, so it's it's going on. Perhaps one more, but short, short question or short answer. <laughs> no. Okay, let's thank Henrik. And next we have our kind organizer running around joining us, Joel Guerrero. The floor is yours. Yes. Everything that could go wrong went wrong in this half an hour. So let me talk about this validation challenge, probably as you were aware. So we were organizing this validation challenge to validate, to see the capabilities of open phone, to address a little bit different problems you maybe are used, obviously not used to NASA problems, the aircraft or automotive. Here we went with a biomedical application. So I don't have any disclosure. This means that there is no human testing involved. And this is the validation case that we were dealing with. You have there the link. And this is a validation case proposed by the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration in US, and they work in two benchmark cases. Okay, we're going to work with the two, which is benchmark two, which is related to the centrifugal pump, okay, block pump. And this is the setup they have. So they conduct the experiments, okay, so it's a very quite, uh, a quite complex uh, experimental setup, okay, and they gather a lot of data, okay? So this is one of the beauty of this case that there is plenty of data available for this setup. So one of the data that we see here, and just to talk a little bit about the experimental data. So we have all these uh, uh, cut length visualizations here. So we have the PIB measurements, velocities, pressure, shear stresses, for a quite complex case, I have to say. Then we have also a lot of measure, measurements of velocity profiles. For instance, here we have this quadrant and velocity profiles in different sections with all the uncertainty. So this is perfect data to do a very exhaustive uh, CFD validation. So more data about the PIB, all this stuff, it's experimental. It is available, so you have the link there. And also some velocity profiles and different conditions. So the experiments, were conducted for six <clears throat> conditions here we, we have. And what is interesting also that for the validation case, what I'm going to present today, we are we asked just for two conditions. Now look at that. What makes it, make it very interesting is that we have same geometry, but a slightly changing the, the mass flow. Look at that. You have completely different behaviors in one region of, the, of your geometry. So in this case, the jet here is going towards my right. In this case, it's toward my, my left, okay? So these are things that the CFD solver should be able, able to, to, con, to capture. So just to show you the geometry, so it's a, it's a simplified geometry. It's not, it's not going to be the same block tone that you put into a human, but it's a simplification, but pretty much we have this top. So we have a inlet, inlet, outlet, the rotor. So the condition can be, uh, can be done in CFD steady or full on steady, okay? So you're free to do, to use any approach. So we're just modeling this section, okay? This is the geometry also is provided by the FDA. They created the case and also they're given the geometry. So one of the things that this case, six years ago, I think it was the first benchmarking validation. And in this one, they did it only with commercial software, okay? So here you have a table with the software that we use. So there are all of them in commercial. So this publication, I think it's 90, uh, 2018. And there is a success uh, publication, very recent, 2023, they revisit this case. So just to show you what they found using the commercial software. So see that here we have the experimental benchmark and then we have different solvers. So for this specific condition, see that the commercial software, they, they work well. And then also, well, steady on steady, but what is interesting is that now we move to another 
condition. And see that, for instance, in this case, 21 is not captured in the, the actual physics. So 21 and one. And these are the small issues that we have to be aware, 23, okay? Even if you are using commercial software, be careful that they can give wrong results like in this case. So also, well, they all <clears throat> gather the CFD data for that benchmarking case, they plot it together. So now let's talk about the open phone because so far there is not much uh, benchmarking in the open phone, uh, using open phone. So we propose this case. There are a few publications around, but we want to go into deep validation. Also, the main objective of this challenge is just to to assess the state, state of the art of turbulence modeling in, in open form, but also moving measures capabilities of the MRF treatment. Also the capability for open form to address different type of measures, because here also there were many participants that provide the measures, very different measures. <clears throat> And then also later we want to, to elaborate a little bit more and then uh, write down some standard practices, okay, about how to set up cases. So what is interesting is that from the point of view of turbulence modeling, in this case, even if the geometry is simplified, it seems to be very easy, even as you take the approach that this is not moving the rotor, from the turbulence point of view, it's very challenging because you can have separation, reattachment, system rotation, okay, curvature, strong vorticity, you have the stagnation point anomaly, adverse pressure gradients, a strongly anisotropic flow, especially here, so you have sudden compression and then you have the expansion of the flow and complex three-dimensional behavior. Everything, you have it together. So here we know that eddy viscosity models, linear ones, they are going to have problems. So we want to assess also further capabilities that we have in open form, like nonlinear models or going into less models. Okay. So also we were looking about some other things, you know, like mesh, different meshes, uh, also details like geometry defeatering. So here there is a very small field. So there is one submission that they managed to resolve that. that <clears throat> that feeling there. And then when we were evaluating the data, we found that there, there was an influence. So there are things that when you say, okay, this is a small feeling, one millimeter, doesn't, doesn't matter. But in this specific case, there is an influence. Or if you are taking the, the, the case of <clears throat> MRA for sliding meshes, you can do like this, you can take the whole region or you can do something like this. So we were assessing all those capabilities in open form. Then also besides that, initialization and inlet in conditions. So the experimental data, they give also some experimental profiles. So testing different profiles, uniform profiles, or using precursor simulations to evolve the flow and then put it here, okay? Testing all those capabilities. So, here are lists of the participants. So this one that we see here, they are presenting. They're in different sessions. So we have this one from Pune University in India. So basically they focus in NCC MRF techniques, transient simulations. They went for everything transient and a little bit in turbulence models. Then we have another submission from GRIPRO. So they, they, there are software provided. They have a very good meshing tool, a structure meshes. So you can see the geometry and you can imagine that generating and a structure mesh for this geometry is quite tricky. So they have a good software that does everything automatically. So they work a lot in structure meshes and great quality issues. They provide the meshes and everything is available. And then we have another submission for Optimate Steco, probably you know who is Steco. They do optimization, they have a very good software. So they took another approach, robust shape optimization of this geometry, and they study shape, shape optimization and hemolysis. Because it's really important about in this case that a study the hemolysis, the block damage that is directly related to turbulence modeling. Okay, then we have another submission for an applied CCN, okay, in Canada, and they work also for, with the FDA and point wise, and they provide also some, <clears throat> some data related to mesh quality and turbulence modeling. Okay, and they are they were the only ones that also study the influence of curvature correction in turbulence. And probably you may be aware that this is something that is missing in open from this curvature correction when it comes for eddy viscosity models. So they study that, they have their own implementation. Besides that, we have NGIS. NGIS, they did it using a couple solver, okay, and they took the approach on a steady, okay, so they, we have some data, also IDAC in Japan, so they study mo more polyhedral meshes and non-uniform inlets, and then wolf dynamics that represented wolf dynamics and dice. So, so we study turbulence models, all turbulence models available in, in open from brands and less mesh quality issues. Also, we work in hemolysis, 
precautions, simulations, and cloud computing, okay? So basically, just to summarize the data, because you can imagine there is a lot of data, and I would like to summarize it with this table for this specific condition, okay? We ask it for two conditions. So not all participants submit it for, 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 for this condition. These participants, they submit it for another, another condition. But here we have a measurement, which is the pressure head, pressure losses, experimental data, and then we have the standard deviation. So here we see that all submissions, pretty much they match well the data, okay? So it's a good tool, open form works even for these kind of tricky, difficult cases. But what is interesting that I would like to point out here, we were using the lean qubit k epsilon, a nonlinear model and we managed to get very good results, but then we switch to a standard k epsilon. And just by definition, I know that in this case, generating a world modeling mesh is really difficult. So probably you might be aware that generating world resolver meshes is not as tricky this is the opposite. Generating a world model image is really tricky because the dimension, the, the geometry is small. But what is interesting, you get a solution, but the error is very high. But what makes it is interesting, when you look at the colors and you have here the k-exilon that we look for pressure, we know that it's wrong, but we compare colors and pre pressure velocities profiles, the results are going to match, okay? So my takeaway here is that don't look just at one measure, look at different measurements, because here in this case, it's just a pure coincidence that due to the fusion, we get a good solution with a method that it shouldn't give a good solution. So here we have the standard K epsilon, lean qubit, good results. Also, we compare K omega SST. This is the Reynolds stress model, okay, that also, this model, it doesn't give good results because it's based in the, in the K epsilon, which is wall modeling. Okay, but it looks nice here, but when you compare with pressure drop, you, you don't get good results. So here we can see that when we can plot the pressure velocities in this section, so you have here, and in this section you plot, you see that we have experimental data and then different velocity profiles. I see that we, we're talking about the k exiton, the results will, will run when you look at the, uh, the pressure, but here the results, they match relatively well. Okay, so always cross-reference your data because just from here, you might get the impression that you have a good result. When you look somewhere else, it's not the right result. Okay, and then just to end in, we look also at a, an isotropic behavior. And we look probably, so you are familiar with this kind of plot, the lonely triangle that measure the anisotropic characteristic of the flow. And here we got the results that we were expecting. So using any eddy viscosity model, here you have, we measure, the shear stress is the strain rate in this region, and we get everything concentrated there that is telling that the flow is, is isotropic, okay? From this point, I'm not going into details, but then when we use a very different model, this is telling, telling us the anisotropic behavior of this flow that is highly anisotropic, something that you cannot see with any of the, any other models, uh, linear models. So here, what is telling us that in some positions, the flow can have this shape or this shape or this shape. And this is right, directly related with the hemolysis. So even as you do your validation, you get right pressure, that right velocity. But then when you go to the next step, and if you don't capture the actual physics, which is here is the anisotropic behavior, your hemolysis will be uh, computed wrong, okay? So also there is rotation. So imagine that this element here will rotate and everything will change. So this is the advantage of using this nonlinear model. So, just to stress also here, we're getting a very good solution at the cost of a, a standard KX zero model. So we capture that, that behavior. Less can do that, but you know that less is very expensive. So just to point out that this impeller is rotating 3,500 RPM. So you can imagine your time step with it less. So the main takeaways here is that open foam demonstrated to be a reliable tool for, uh, for this biomedical application. It's performance comparable to that of commercial software. We also tell, confront, uh, compare with Fluent, Fluent and CFX and the Star CCN, and we got the same performance. And in some cases, open foam was even better, faster, better results. Okay, so because you are paying a lot for a commercial software, it doesn't mean that it's, be it's the best tool. And just to stress also, we found that uh, the solver is pretty much mesh agnostic. We put very different meshes, different polyhedra, tetra, structural meshes, and uh, open for manas to digest everything. Even if you run check mesh and you get non-orthogonality in it, it managed to get good results, okay? Then talking about uh, a snappy X mesh, okay, is a little bit behind when compared with commercial tools. Okay? We have to be clear with that, and the main issue is the prismatic layers, okay? 
Uh, it's highly scalable, open phone, and can be easily deployed on the cloud. We run many simulations at very low cost using the cloud. And talking about the NCC, which was recently uh, released by our foundation, we did some comparisons with the M MRF. It's difficult to say if there is any advantage. We didn't find any advantage when it comes to uh, conservation, pretty much similar results. Okay. Uh, regarding turbulence modeling, uh, the capabilities are comparable to those of commercial software are even open phone is even better than commercial software because if you use, for instance, CFX or Fluent, there you don't find these nonlinear models, okay? Or probably you have it, but they're hidden and they're calibrated for our space simulations. Here you have everything available. So we found that this capability you now is having all these models much better than commercial software. Talking about uh, world modeling, I have to say there is a little bit behind. So commercial software, they have better corrections than open phone, but I think that is something that can be relatively easy corrected. Also, the curvature correction is missing in open. Something that you don't have, probably you have the stagnation point correction intrinsic in the model, but this curvature correction that in this case is important, you don't have it. So that is a point of improvement. Okay, so just to thanks to all the participants. So we have Eight, part eight participants, seven that submit for simulations. Okay, at least for this presentation, there were 12 groups interested, but just seven make it to the, this presentation. And also the measures are available in the website. So we have also six different types of measures. So you see that we have uh, software vendors that they provide the measures. So Greek, Pro, Beta, Chi, NGs, and Innova, they provide very different measures. So everything is available for your benchmarking. So with that, I end. thank you very much. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Perfect. I have a question for you. What about the, ah, sorry. Yes. Uh, no, the, the, the properties are given by the FDA. So it's a uh, density close to water and viscosity is a little bit high, but close to water, but they give the properties. Any more questions? What about the meshes submitted? What was the preference, automatic meshing or? <laughs> For me, polyhedral meshes. Oh. I'm a believer of polyhedral meshes, so use polyhedral meshes, the best one. I thought we found that they were the, the best one, the faster convergence, best results, polyhedral. Okay. It's can you repeat the question? Yes, the FDA, they have different challenges. Yes, they have different. So you go to the website and they are actually they are going, I think they are going to do another different geometry. So they're working on that. Uh, which model? Uh, ah, similar results. Less, there are a few, few, we have some data, super expensive, but the results are, are similar. So nonlinear managed to capture the same behavior as for LS at the cost of basically two hours with 32. Thank you. Okay, we can. Thank our speaker. Thank you, Joel. And with this, we finish this block of technical presentations. Thank you.